native people, native culture, native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier native voice in native programming. There's a heartbeat louder than thunder, revolution is in the air. There's a heartbeat deep inside our mother, are you too cool? To now, with Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native News and Native Entertainment. I'm Jeannie Green. Today we travel to Canada, to the west shores of the Hudson Bay, thanks to viewer Kevin Fredland, who lives at Rankin Inlet. We'll be visiting that community. Also, traveling to Florida, the Seminole Tribe is an industrious one, and we'll find out about some of the industry in that area. We also travel to Pablo, Montana. Roy Big Crane gives us a report on a unique situation with the dam in that area. We have Native American and Canadian Native music videos. Here's Gary Fife with Native News Across the Nation. I'll be back in just a moment. Alaska Native elders are calling for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to apologize to them for charging them with killing walruses only for the tusks. A number of headless walrus were found this summer in northwest Alaska. Federal agents said the animals had been killed by natives solely for the ivory tusks. Native elders say the carcasses had been lost during regular native walrus harvest, and they're demanding a formal apology. Two tribal leaders in New Mexico have asked state officials to give them a herd of buffalo that the state plans to sell at auction, but the state is saying no. The request came from two native legislators who went to the state's game commission, but the request was falling on deaf ears of commissioners who still favor selling the 70 bison at auction, but they say tribes may get to bid first. If you're a native graduate student, the University of California in Berkeley may have some offerings to help you in your education. UC Berkeley is actively recruiting native graduate students in the field of public health, social work, and other related fields. Recruiters say the UC Berkeley program could provide stipends of up to $30,000 for qualified students. If the grind of the academic life doesn't quite appeal to you, here's another West Coast educational opportunity. The Cabazon Band of Mission Indians in Indio, California, is teaming up with local Chapman University to offer the first ever casino management certificate in that state. It'll be the first time such a program is being offered outside the gambling cities of Reno and Las Vegas. And we'll be right back with more native news across the nation right after this. Contact Heartbeat Alaska with your news. Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. That's Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call at 1-907-563-7440 or fax us at 1-907-563-9309. Heartbeat Alaska, your news is our news. In recent years, some native regional for-profit corporations have had shareholders upset with management practices and distribution of corporate dividends. Shareholder uprisings have occurred at Sea Alaska and at Cook Inlet Region Incorporated. The latest dissent is occurring with Chugach Alaska Corporation, where a group called Concern Shareholders for Chugach are upset with corporate management controls and contracts, native hire and promotion practices, and present personnel costs. Chugach managers say they're not familiar with the dissatisfied shareholders, that their management has brought corporate stability, and they do have a record of shareholder hire. The dissident group plans to run for its board in the October elections. 
It's always nice to be able to report another opportunity for a tribe's members to learn their own language. This time it's my own tribe, the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, and their linguistic partner is Oklahoma City University. OCU is offering Creek language courses on a non-credit basis to interested folks. Students will be taught a small basic vocabulary and some sentence structure. And that's a nice mudo to OCU. A native alternative school in Minneapolis is having a continuing battle over its leadership. The Heart of the Earth Survival School in Minneapolis serves native students who have troubles in the public school system. In the last two years, the school has had three regular and two acting principals. Some principals have been dismissed over questions of missing money and criminal backgrounds. I'm Gary Fife, and if you have any news about your tribe, your group, or an upcoming event, please share it with us. Now back to Jeannie and more Heartbeat Alaska. Thank you, Gary. Travel with me now to Pablo, Montana. Roy Big Crane reports on a unique situation with the dam in that area. Kerr Dam, a large hydropower site in Montana, located on tribal land on the Flathead Reservation, has been offered for sale to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. The tribes would buy and take over operation of the dam in the year 2015 under an agreement with Montana Power Company. The early sellout proposal elicited this response from tribal chair, Rhonda Sweeney. The tribes have not begun formal discussions with MPC. We intend to do a careful review of the economic impacts of an early buyout. In their press release, the Montana Power Company asserts the tribes can operate the facility at a lower cost. However, the rental money we receive on the lease site is currently factored into the tribe's operating budget. The tribes will need to determine the increased revenue that is needed to maintain the current budget. We will also conduct an internal review of overall mitigation costs and other economic factors involved with an early buyout. The tribes anticipate that MPC will ask for a stay in the $47.4 million mitigation cost during this review process. The Tribal Council has gone on record to neither support nor oppose a request for such a stay. Mitigation costs are for restoration of the fishery on the Flat River below the dam. This restoration is necessary due to damage caused by flow patterns in the river from the operation of Kerr Dam as a peak power generation facility. This is Roy Big Crane from Salish Kootenai College Public TV reporting for Heartbeat Alaska. Thank you, Roy. We travel now to Florida for a groundbreaking tribe. The Seminole Tribe shows us some of their industry. And a jumper with Seminole Broadcasting. We're here this afternoon in Big Cypress at uh, a new project that the council funded this year. And the name of the new project is called Seminole Farms. And today I have Roy Pippen with me, who is the management part of the Seminole Farms, and I wanted him to explain possibly uh, what he planted to start out here this year, but also at the same time, he's planting something already again. If he could tell me what, what he started out with and where he's at now. Well, Danny, we started off planting peppers, and we planted first what we call the fall crop, which plants right on in to the winter crop, and then yeah. continues right on in to what we call the spring crop. And today we're planting what would be the spring crop plantings, uh -huh. which will be harvesting this coming spring. Yeah, one of the things that I was noticing is that you have a lot of people here and uh, a lot of equipment. Uh, where are you getting your manpower from? Well, actually, we have about close to 70 or 80 people, that workers that live right on the farm in facilities that we provided for them. Uh -huh. The balance of the workers come from the Mockley area. Uh -huh. So what is your forecast for, for this year? Is, uh, does the tribe make a good investment uh, as far as doing Seminole Farms and they might get a good return this year or not? Everything's looking real good. Uh -huh. The price has been good. The, the crop has been excellent. Quality's been good. We've had good acceptance throughout the marketplace and uh, everything's going real good and looks very promising. This is a scene here where we are laying uh, plastic mulch, putting down our fumigation material and our fertilizer materials and forming the beds. Uh, blue tanks on the front of the tractor are uh, filled with methyl bromide, which kills uh, soil-borne diseases. This machine injects the 
liquid down in the bed and also lays the uh, top mix fertilizer in the bands on top of the beds. This scene, we're harvesting the peppers. These plants are approximately 65 days old. And on this particular machine, uh, it takes 45 workers. And uh, the peppers are, are harvested. They go up down the conveyor belts up into a washer and a waxer, which washes the peppers, brushes them, then are sized with the graders up on the machine. We have a box maker up top that makes the boxes, sends them down below to the packers. And the, the peppers are sized from jumbo size to extra large, to large, to a medium, to a small. We make about six or seven different sizes. This piece of machinery does a real good job. It eliminates, it's a state-of-the-art high-tech piece of machinery which eliminates bruising and a lot of damage that's done the old conventional way of picking in uh, buckets, dumping into bin boxes, then taken to a 40, 50 miles to a packing house, and then dumped out through a lot of machinery and which uh, has a tendency to do some bruising and damage to the peppers. This machine eliminates a lot of that. These peppers come off of the plants and they're washed, graded, packed, sized, palletized in a matter of about three minutes. And then they're taken directly from this harvesting machine into Seminole Farms cooling facility, which they're pre-cooled for couple of hours before shipping to the northern markets. Peppers are coming down the grading belt. They've been through the washer and the brushes. As you can see, these are gorgeous, healthy, beautiful bell peppers. And this is a machine operator that drives the, the tractor that pulls the machine. It's moving at approximately a, a half a mile an hour very, very slow. And here we are receiving the Seminole brand peppers into our new cooling and uh, shipping sales facility. They were unloaded off of a farm truck and uh, go right into the cooler. They're placed in the coolers and all the field heat is pulled out of the pepper product, cooled down to about 40 degrees then they're ready to go on to the, on to the refrigerated trucks to go north. From Florida, we travel north to Canada, thanks to viewer Kevin Fredland. He lives in a community called Rankin Inlet on the west shores of Hudson Bay. The Inuit of Rankin Inlet, like natives across the north, love to gather for fun during the holidays. This is called ball bouncing. These guys take their fun very seriously. Today, Rankin Inlet is home to over 2,000 Inuit. 80% of the population are Inuit and three quarters of the population speak in their native tongue of Inuktitut. Yet as early as the 1960s, only 320 people lived here. Ball bouncing, one of the fun activities that natives gather during holidays in the community hall. Now these girls aren't quite as mercenary, a little more demure, but still they're competitive.
located at the head of Rankin Inlet on the shores of Hudson Bay. The community developed as a result of mining in the area. Before the coming of the Europeans, the Inuit seldom frequented the area because of the lack of reliable game. The Cyril Knight Prospecting Company explored Rankin Inlet in 1928. And during the Korean War, the price of nickel rose sharply and the North Ranklin Nickel Mine was opened. It operated from 1957 until 1962 when a combination of declining prices and depletion of the ore body forced closure of the mine. Many Inuit came in off the land to work in the mine during those years. The North Rankin Nickel Mine was the first modern mine in the history of the Canadian Arctic. It was the first mine ever to train and employ Inuit in almost all facets of the mining operations. The mine closed in 1962, with many of the Inuit moving back to their original homes. In 1964, the population dwindled to about 320 people. The recovery was slow. Today, Rankin Inlet is a thriving community with 140 businesses, many owned by the Inuit people. For thousands of years, Inuit have shown that Arctic people are able to adapt to natural change in their lives. Although North American Indians went through a long history of broken treaties, treaties were never negotiated with Canadian Inuit. However, when territorial governments, provinces, or colonial administrations were set up, they automatically incorporated the Inuit into these new institutions. When the European concept of land ownership was introduced, the result was a loss of Inuit lands because the Inuit could not prove ownership. Today, Inuit are aggressively pursuing the control and ownership of the lands and waters in their territories. Okay, let's yeah. go. <laughs> like natives across the north, the citizens of Rankin Inlet live in two worlds celebrating national holidays. Still, they go berry picking, hunting, and fishing. There are 18 dog teams in Rankin Inlet. And while it's a fairly new community, the Inuit here have made it home, thriving actually, with modern businesses. But overlooking the town is a constant reminder of their past. The Anukshuk, a stone sculpture an immense version of the stone figures that used to mark landing places or were used to drive caribou into areas where they could be taken with bows and arrows. It's a symbol of the Inuit people here, strong, adaptable, and enduring. And then this is a doodle. Morris? Morris? Oh, that's, that's, that's one Auntie Mary's daughter. <laughs> 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 Our brother, taking you home. Morning, <laughs> bear, go home. Grandson. You can't be practicing this unnecessary violence. You can't be hurting somebody just for the sake of hurting them. You must let your heart guide you. What do you mean, Grandfather? The way of the warrior is to protect. It's not to practice unnecessary violence. This violence could hurt the ones that you love later on in life. You must learn this now, while you're young, while you still have a chance. The warrior's path is a spiritual path, and when you're on that path, you must learn to protect those you love, your family, and all of society. That is the path I'm talking about. Let your heart guide you. Grandson, the way of the warrior is a spiritual path. Oh, I see him. 
To follow this path, you must live in balance with all things. Oh, shame. To be in balance, you must live in harmony with all people. Oh, shame. Violence pulls you off this path. Oh, shame. As lovers were smoldering sweet grass Stopped only to kiss you and I Through the smoke rising upwards I saw your face Nobody knows where to go Singing is more than just hitting the right notes. We ain't made Acting is beyond reciting words from a script. It's capturing the emotions that cause the twinge in your heart, create the chill in your skin, and ultimately bring us all together. Smiled when we parted and cried when we met. Singer or actor, no matter which role Tom Jackson is playing, he performs from his soul. I hope you have no regrets. Born on a small reserve called One Arrow in Saskatchewan, Canada, Tom has remained true to his Aboriginal roots and is an example of contemporary Native culture in television, film, and in music. You know, I, I lived on a, in a white community, and I don't mean to say a white community, except that my father was English and my mother was, was Cree, and my father was in the Air Force, so there weren't many children around that looked Native as I looked Native. And I'm a half-breed, and I'm very proud of that, and I'll wave that flag until the end of my days. I didn't see a lot of Native people around in those days because it was not a Native community. So I didn't really get this Cowboys and Indians thing. And all the good guys were good guys to me, and all the bad guys were bad guys. Let me wrap you in my blanket every day More than just protection and more than dignity I'll shout it or I'll whisper quietly. Ah, oh, what matters is that you're in love with me. I will pledge my affection to the matters of your heart. This house will be no home if we're apart. Whoa, humble me. Tom Jackson is one of Canada's most recognizable actors. His striking Cree and English features have highlighted his appearances in leading roles in such films as Margaret Lawrence's contemporary classic, The Diviners, and in Medicine River with Graham Greene, star of Dances with Wolves. Can't wait another minute, baby, gotta humble me. Every week, 26 countries around the world welcome Tom into their homes in his guest starring role in the U.S.'s PBS children's television series, Shining Time Station. I'm a little new at this myself. But we have to have some rules. Okay? If you have a problem, I want you to come to me with your problem. And you have to tell me the truth. Deal? Deal. And in his lead role in CBC TV's popular dramatic series, North of 60. They were going to pay your price. They'll pay the price. Why? Because they want the fur. A powerful performer, Tom has been nominated in Canada for a Television Gemini Award for Best Actor and a Genie Award for Best Supporting Actor in Film. Some kind of trouble, just want to have fun. You can believe tonight I'll do you no wrong. Come on, baby, do me right, because I got nothing gold. Recently, Tom made his latest directorial effort with his second music video, Few and Far Between, now airing on Canada's premier country music television network, NCN. Singing and songwriting have always been Tom's first love. His distinctive deep baritone commands attention instantly with its power his lyrics with their wisdom. When you lay 
your head upon my chest you know it leaves me feeling high but you know it scares me half to death to look into your eyes Tom Jackson's newest release on Peg Music, No Regrets, is his fourth album, and his first enjoying major record label distribution, a long overdue achievement for this compelling singer and songwriter. I've been doing all the things that I've done, and all of a sudden, I have this opportunity to do television. All of a sudden, I have this opportunity to do an album. I mean, I've been playing music for 30 years. All of a sudden, I'm going to do an album that has a national release. I can't deny it. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's real exciting for me. I've said before that I thought life was like a game of pool. Every game I play, I play to win. Tom's desire to win is matched by his desire to help those in need. An entertainer and humanitarian, he uses his music to raise money and food for the homeless and the hungry. Tom has begun a tradition of benefit concerts called Huron Carol that are performed each December. He donates proceeds from the shows and from an album of the same name to soup kitchens across Canada. For the price of a can of peas, if you had the opportunity, would you save somebody's life? I've not met anybody who said no. And that's all this project is all about. This project is about saving lives through feeding people. I have no regrets. None. All the things that uh, I've been privy to or experienced, some of them not so pleasant, some of them pleasant, but um, you can't take it away. Not for me. You can't have it. I won't give it to you. I am, well, I am what I am because of the experiences that I've been privy to. And I'm not displeased with the person that I am. I hope Tom Jackson, one of our favorites. Perhaps we'll have an interview with him for Heartbeat Alaska. Wouldn't that be fun? Something to look forward to in our future. Thank you so much, Kevin Fredland from Canada, for your video. Also, thank you, Roy Big Crane from SKC TV in Pablo, Montana. Danny Jumper contributed from Seminole Tribe in Florida. I hope you had fun today. I hope you learned something, too. I'm Jeannie Green for all of us here. God bless you. Have a fabulous week. And join us again for Native News next week. I hope someday that we'll walk that mile. Dance to the sound of my drum. Laugh in a rain dance just to see you smile. Making love in the sun. Fear that haunts me like a bird of prey. I feel you're restless and I want you to stay. But a young wolf howls and you'll run someday. And she whispered, I hope you have no regrets. I hope you have no regrets. I think I'm falling and I need your best. I hope you 